This rather large video was sponsored by Skillshare. Full disclosure here, reviewing all three episodes in one video was definitely part of my grand plan. When these episodes came out 12 years ago, I was on holiday for four weeks. When I came back to the UK, I had three brand new episodes to watch in one go. Russell T Davies can deny his famous three-parter stories all he likes, but I now firmly consider them to be three-parters. Rewatching these episodes in this back-to-back -back format that makes them feel like a self-contained movie. Going back over these episodes has been tremendously inspiring to me. Unfortunately, I lack the know-how or practice in producing point-and-shoot media to make those dreams a reality, but I could easily learn how to with Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of different classes to spur your creativity. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. Whether you write, film, draw, design, photograph, compose, manage, there's definitely a class for you. For example, I've found Penny Lane's class on filmmaking from home very informative. My reviews require found footage and images extensively, so if you're thinking of making content like mine, you should definitely give this class a watch. Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads and they are always launching new premium classes for you to enjoy. Right now, Skillshare is giving away an amazing two months of Skillshare Premium for free. A year's membership comes to £7 a month, which is ridiculously good value. All you have to do is click the link below, and the first 1,000 of you to do so will receive that super sweet two months of premium for free. Now, without further ado, let's get on with this gargantuan review. After 100 yards, turn left. I quite like the opening of this episode. It's not like the Doctors visited the planet China much in the revival, and hey, they even sell butterbeer. Donna gets convinced to have her tea leaves read, and these flashback jolts were a bit weird. I did love watching Sylvia try to control Donna's life, though, enacting this tyrannical mother character thinking she always knows what's best for her daughter. City executives don't need temps, except for practice. Oh, such harsh words. When the moment repeats itself again, though, I felt Donna's altered response. Yeah. Suppose you're right. Came off as a bit flat. This was then followed by some cringy acting from the soothsayer. Turn right and change the world. Who previously played the character Chantho in the episode Utopia. This opening definitely feels a bit underwhelming, but it's what follows that makes this episode so memorable. It also reminds me of the Futurama episode starring the What If machine. What if Donna turned right? Seeing the Billy Piper credits in the title sequence, though, was enough to get the blood pumping with excitement. No, not that kind of excitement, you dirty-minded person. The first butterfly effect moment has Donna celebrating Christmas with her friends instead of getting married. Now that the butterfly has been trodden on, we see the first deviation. The Christmas spider was stopped, but at the cost of the Doctor's life. Removing him from the equation doesn't feel as intense as removing Donna in Midnight, but they can get away with some great comedy instead of making a pure horror-based episode. The hell is that? Ken Livingston, that's what? Spending our money on decoration! This comedy comes at the cost of tragedy, though, as we face a reality where the Doctor actually died. This creates such a strange atmosphere because it not only reminds us that the Doctor isn't actually invincible, but to my memory, no episode in the show has toyed with a what-if question as detrimental as this before. It was nice seeing Bill from the Sontaran episode show up to announce the Doctor's death here, too. There's also the tragedy of Donna perpetually putting herself down or having her mother do it for her. All this implies there was nothing special about Donna, but in this episode we get concrete proof of how beneficial she can be. Rose also acts to prove to Donna her necessity in the plot. Her appearances in this episode are great, adding to the strangeness of the tale. She doesn't get the big fanfare entrance, but just runs onto the scene filled with disbelief upon hearing the death of the Doctor. It was great having companions old and new run into each other in these episodes. It's an experience like when River met Donna, except here we're familiar with both companions through a 
and through, which makes their conversations that much more interesting to me. Rose can appear at random intervals with a juxtaposing personality of confusion and genius. It's this episode where the whole revival series begins to fit together like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. Conversations from series four about missing planets, bees, something being on Donna's back, or even the little Rose cameos display an astounding level of foresight on behalf of Davies and his writing team. We then get another humorous scene when Donna gets laid off. It definitely felt a bit too am I bothered for my liking, but the scene takes us back to when Donna first met the Doctor. When all the other famous encounters with the third kind happened, Donna just didn't want to know. She can't see the tragedy going on outside because she herself is consumed by it. I loved the music in this scene as well, as the deviation from reality started to escalate, ascending piano keys are heard, adding layers of surrealism to this bizarre scenario. Just like in Forest of the Dead, we have another instance of a life Donna could have led, but it's even stranger as the Doctor's absence racks up the death toll to an astonishing degree. A hospital disappears and reappears with 2,000 people dead, including Martha Jones. It's a shame that Harold Saxon doesn't get named in this scenario, but the Master's plans just become the year that never happened, so I'm not too fussed about them overlooking that particular potentiality. According to this article from BBC America, in the early writing stages of this episode, a band of unit soldiers were set to go back in time and stop the Carrionites from the Shakespeare Code. As cool as that sounds, adding all the overlooked events of series three and four probably would have stunted the pace of this episode horribly, as it already does an amazing job of condensing two years of Doctor Who into one episode. Seeing the nobles react to the day's events was once again really funny, but also really sad. Only Wilf, perfectly passionate as always, has gotten the memo that people are dying by alien hands, whilst the women are grumbling about a lost job. Get some perspective, woman! More of Sylvia's berating came at the right time too. Tragedy has befallen Donna and thousands of people have died today. The last thing she needs is her mum claiming she's a lost hope. What an awful thing to say. Even hearing about Sarah Jane's crew and Torchwood's crew all reported dead starts simmering this idea of the Doctor's army that would be fleshed out in the following episodes. With a stroke of luck, the nobles win themselves a Christmas weekend hotel holiday. As if things weren't weird enough already, now they're putting Grandad on the sofa whilst the ladies get to sleep in beds? Disgraceful! <laughs> Either way, this scene escalates into disaster once again. When Donna sees the Titanic on TV, I loved that line. Is that a film or something? Seeing the explosion itself from miles away was fantastic too. I myself am frightened by the prospect of nuclear apocalypse, and I reckon that image implanted that fear deep into the recesses of my brain. The only thing that spoils this scene is right at the end with this maid pointing at Donna. I just burst out laughing. What a weird shot this is. The mass migration of Londoners began with the nobles being relocated to Leeds. I loved that big Leeds stamp. That genuinely cracked me up. Once again though, disaster hits our protagonist and her family. From riches to rags, they get lumped in with the most eccentric Italian man in the world. Hey, it's a big house. This is your palazzo. It's good. It's fun. The episode is certainly a budget saver, but it's the writing that constructs this episode magnificently. Donna's comments about there being no war because nobody's fighting back against the aliens put everything into perspective. The Earth is now just a punching bag, and this fact visibly drains the positivity out of our characters. The emergency government appears to embody patriotism patriotism gone overboard, matching how Davies would handle the same topic in his show years and years. Fortunately, the way it's handled in Doctor Who is far more mature and less on the nose. The populace are so docile with thousands, even millions of people dead now. What's another thousand? What's another million? This bit when Mr. Colasanto got driven away to a labor camp though was so awful to watch. His never-ending optimism and sea shanties, and then to see his face drain of that enthusiasm and crying with his family. Good 
God. It's like the emergency government took a if you can't beat them, join them approach to exterminating human beings. Even the slight glimmer of hope that America will save the day gets flattened when a fifth of their population get turned into adipose. What a great twist as well that as Donna chose right instead of left, Miss Foster chose the United States instead of the UK. Normally I'd complain about this information being delivered by more of those godforsaken filming the TV segments, but they are used sparingly and are good reaction points for our characters in this episode. It would have been easy to just use them for every alien encounter in this episode, but seeing all the tragedy from the ground level enhances our narrow audience perspective on the story. Turn Left also tries playing on invisible fear again with this bug that's latched onto Donna's back, except it doesn't quite work so well by the end of a first viewing. This soldier is frightened out of his wits by the thing on Donna's back, but when we find out later it was just an overgrown stag beetle, his fear becomes totally unbelievable. It's after the quote unquote present is reached that things start getting dark. Real dark. Like, the stars are going out dark. It's so iconic and still sends shivers down my spine. It's coming, no, no. It's coming from across the stars and nothing can stop it. What is the darkness? And that was the darkness. I also liked that the fire makes it appear as though the pair are looking at hell itself. Donna's had enough of her miserable existence and finally joins Rose and Unit. I loved Donna's first time in the TARDIS all over again. Her jaw drops, then she closes it and it drops again as though a battle of questioning reality is going through Donna's head right now. The reveal scene with the bug was a bit waffly though. Due to the episode merely playing with a what if machine, whatever Rose is babbling about is rendered kind of pointless. Donna then gets sent back in time to make herself turn left instead of right. I can justify the adoption of repetition in the previous three episodes, but hearing this same conversation between Donna and Sylvia three or four times just grinds me up a bit because it's not like it's done for any effect. Had they introduced this conversation earlier in the series, it might not have been so jarring. It's just repetitive for the sake of emphasizing the importance of the event. It's just a shame that it's so mundane that the event itself is hard to have emotional resonance. Like something out of a nightmare, Donna has to come face to face with death in order to stop the bug thing, bug thing from changing reality itself? I don't know, this is where the episode confuses me. The bug itself appears rather underwhelming after all that transpires. Apparently it's a reference to a classic Who episode with a spider on Sarah Jane's back, so I guess it's not too offensive. Then we're once again treated to more of that subpar acting from Chantho. What are you? What will you be? But the bad wolf reveal was really nice. Suddenly all the writing around them gets turned into bad wolf, warning of Rose's return and the barriers between worlds collapsing. The doctor's lump in his throat delivery was incredibly powerful too. This nightmare scenario and seeing the TARDIS reddened like the paradox machine in the previous year, shit is about to get serious. The first nightmare is over, but the second wave. It's only just beginning. So, did it suck? It's not perfect, but it's very enjoyable, engaging, ambitious, and emotional. I know some people don't like Rose's performance, but honestly, I think she does a fine job. It would certainly feel inconsistent had this episode not been in a contained bubble, which not only makes it the perfect companion episode to Midnight, but is also the perfect precursor to the final two episodes. Some of the delivery of the dialogue leaves a lot to be desired, and it can get confusing and repetitive at times too. It's undoubtedly cheap, but it goes without saying. What they did with the cheap episode was amazing, surreal, frightening, funny. A plethora of emotions are to be had in this episode. And it finally feels like the end is nigh. I give Turn Left an 8 out of 10. Thanks for watching. What do you think of this episode? Comment below your. They stole it from us! 
We jump into the middle episode rather jarringly. It's easy to argue that this red TARDIS bad wolf thing gets tossed out without explanation, but I find this scene with the milkman more than adequate. We were expecting the end of the world, but everything's fine. The episode even aired on a Saturday, Saturday. so the Doctor even got the day right this time. Good. The music definitely gives off this super strange vibe too. Of course, only when the pair leave with a diagnosis of everything's fine does the milkman's cart start shaking. Poor milkman. Does anybody still get milk delivered? Just curious, not sure if this is the episode's age showing or not. The Doctor's reaction from serious to joyful when they're talking about Rose was so adorable. It couldn't last long though as the pair reopen the TARDIS to find empty space. I think it's the simplicity of this moment that was truly praiseworthy. We don't have a big establishing shot or an outward zoom, we just see what they see. Nothing. Just to get this sense of isolation and bewilderment, the camera moves right in on our protagonist's faces. It's such a great reveal, despite only being two minutes in. Across the universe. All the subplots and spin-offs converge, as everybody who was on Earth during the Vanishing Act is urged to look outside. It is from our poor old milkman's point of view that we get this wonderful shot with Rose. As the camera lifts up, we get the most epic display of special effects. A jaw-dropping scale is placed right before our eyes. As if that wasn't enough to get one excitement, the bombardment of special guests' names in the title credits was absolutely incredible. And it just kept going in the following scene. I loved that TV segment with Richard Dawkins and Paul O'Grady too. They were the last people I would have expected to see on Doctor Who. Funnily enough though, and this is according to the BBC's fact file on the episode, Paul O'Grady is just a big fan of Doctor Who, and Richard Dawkins' involvement is astoundingly interesting. Back in Tom Baker's era, two actresses played the role of the companion Romana, because she was a Time Lord and, spoiler alert, she regenerated. The second actress to play this character, Lala Ward, was, in 2008, married to Richard Dawkins, and allegedly the pair were introduced to one another by none other than Douglas Adams, writer of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and several episodes of Classic Who. What useless information I'm able to find on the internet. Despite the humour, these moments ground the episode into reality, making it that much more engaging. So much was happening in so many locations you'd expect it to be disconnected, but all plots connected together beautifully. Donna fretting about her family leads to Gwen checking on her family. Torchwood get intel about something in the centre of the planet, Sarah Jane gets the same thing. That's not a planet! It's a space station. Then the ships appear, which leads us back to America again, with Martha unable to contact the Doctor. Naturally, you'd expect it to jump back to the Doctor in the TARDIS, but we then see it all kicking off on the ground level again with looting, panic, anarchy, hysteria, and Rose wandering through it all. It's edited and filmed fantastically. It was so great seeing everybody react to this one Dalek voice message on repeat. Not only does every single ex-companion know exactly whose voice that is, but the fear they express is what sets the tone for the remainder of the story. The choral score gives off grandiosity and dread, and it's only afterwards that we see the scale of this invasion fleet once again from the ground level. This makes the situation all the more frightening when you consider that this would be how you would see this apocalypse. The cherry on the cake of it all, and a big red one at that, that, the Supreme Dalek. Doesn't he look gorgeous? It's cool, but it's nowhere near as intimidating as the shot afterwards of a whole fleet crowding around him, chanting their mantra of supremacy. Even whilst all the pieces are coming together, the show still introduces new plots and ideas into the mix. Project Indigo, the Osterhagen key. The ultimate code red! Cool. That's how you know shit's serious when it's ultimate code red. All elements that keep us hooked to find out what else Davies has up his sleeve for the finale. Seeing Martha's friend get exterminated was a bit weird though. Her death is like so many others where people think they can run away from the Daleks and then die in the most cheesy way possible. Martha's route of escape has people urging her on both sides. This moment works tremendously because she had previously worked for Torchwood but her loyalties lie with Unit. The red herring that she's been killed as a result of experimental alien technology briefly leaves us stunned. Thankfully, with hindsight, 
sight, we know it's all okay. But it's worse for a first time viewer. The fact she's been given this shocking key means there must be more for Martha lined up, even though Jack believes she's been scattered into atoms. I loved all the teasing that went on on The Crucible too. Davros silhouetted with these close ups on his disheveled hand and buttons, like a creepy, hyper intelligent baby. Even Dalek Khan shows up, another crestfallen genius Dalek imprisoned in the depths of Dalek Town. Nicholas Briggs voices both Khan and the Red Dalek superbly, giving them both such uniqueness just from the voice work. Khan's gone mad, and these aspects of the Dalek hierarchy are so cannibalistic and intriguing. The one Dalek who does nothing but speak the truth is regarded as insane. The way it wriggles and laughs just sends shivers down my spine every time. Like in Parting of the Ways, the Daleks despise their means of revival, but are in so much denial about it that it will ultimately lead to their undoing. As though things on Earth weren't exciting enough, the Doctor takes Donna to the Shadow Proclamation. Another long in the making aspect of the Hooniverse makes its way onto our screens. The design of this place's exterior is stunning, and as soon as they arrive, the hype train smacks Crashes through the ceiling with the doctor commanding in uh Jadunian Jadunies? Who gives a fuck? This is awesome! I don't think anybody was expecting the Jadun to make a return here, but now we establish what authority these rhino men operate under. This strange woman who looks like she's got a lot of funerals to attend can't believe she's in the presence of a Time Lord. This was amazing to me because the Doctor's been citing the Shadow Proclamation's articles and conventions since day one. I seek audience with the nesting consciousness under peaceful contract according to Convention 15 of the Shadow Proclamation. And he hasn't once directly come into contact with them? More of those jigsaw pieces set up throughout Series 4 are presented here. It was amazing to see all the missing planets accumulated in this hologram, a much more efficient and beautiful vision than just having gigantic sweeping shots of all 27 planets. It's the perfect excuse for some downtime from all the carnage that is taking place on Earth. Fortunately, the bees will lead our protagonist to the missing planets, which confused me, but my idiot brain is telling me that because they'd set those seeds right at the start of series four, it's all okay. It was great that after another emotional blow to Donna, the Doctor mimics her mockingly, only to turn into excitement and admiration. He wants to leave as soon as possible, but the SP are ready to wage holy war against the Daleks. I'd never acknowledged their religious angle before this rewatch. And this aspect alone would have benefited from showing up now and again, but like the Reapers in Father's Day, they're given grandiosity and importance only for them to never show up again. Well, they did get one pointless scene in The Magician's Apprentice, but I think you guys get what I mean. It was a truly entertaining moment seeing the Doctor just giving the middle finger to these guys and disappearing. There's some really great cinematography in this moment too, as the leader makes these grand statements of war. The camera cuts to wider and longer shots, working the opposite way with the Doctor, in that the camera starts at a mid-shot and slowly reaches a close-up by the time he decides to deceive them. We know exactly what he's going to do before he's even beaming at Donna, and this is what makes it such a satisfying moment. Back on Earth, we have this horrific moment with a family being burned to a crisp in their own home, and Wolf's paint gun moment was hilarious, hopeful, tragic, Ugh. and then Rose's appearance turned up the badassness of it all. Ugh. Remind me never to use that phrase again. Everything seemed to be all doom and gloom until Harriet Jones started popping up on everybody's screens. This Zoom-esque technology at play here would be bafflingly advanced back in 2008, but here in 2020, it's honestly hilarious. You can't hear me. Have you got a webcam? No, she up. wouldn't let me. She said they're naughty. Hello? <laughs> Martha Jones! 
Who is she? I thought it was about time we all met, given the current crisis. Harriet Jones was another character I thought we'd never see again, just because the last time she appeared was in the Christmas Invasion. She is the perfect candidate to unite all the Doctor's forces though. The waning politician believing the public to have forgotten her, when in fact most people, including audience members, do remember her. The running gag of the former Prime Minister, we know who you are, was fantastic, almost as though Russell himself was worried nobody would have remembered her three and a half years since her last appearance. This gag also makes her death that much more noteworthy, not only because the Daleks know who she is, but because she ends up being the perfect politician, a true servant of the people by sacrificing herself for the greater good. The Osterhagen key then gets thrown into the mix again and my god it just sends shivers down my spine how volatile Harriet's reaction to it was. That key is not to be used Dr Jones, not under any circumstances. This surreal and alarming sound effect that plays underneath her is so disturbing. Even more surreal is that Harriet was right all along. A time has come when the Doctor hasn't appeared to save the day and we're over 30 minutes into this episode. This is the first time this army of the Doctors gets actually mentioned and on the surface it would appear like a great idea. The Daleks undoubtedly need to be stopped, but this is all going on behind the Doctor's back. What on earth is he going to think of all this when he finally gets in touch? When he does, it's so bloody sad considering only Rose has yet to make contact with him. Even though they're closer than they have been since Doomsday, a barrier remains to keep them apart. This is shown visibly in these matching close-ups with some form of black diagonal line protruding the frame. To top it all off, off, the Doctor's theme rings out in full glory. What a beautiful moment. All that emotion is put on hold as Davros takes control of the call. He is so ugly. His empty eye sockets and a blue third eye was just so strange and unsettling. This head brace thing gives him a Frankenstein-esque appearance too. He loves this big address of his, showing off his saviour and the Dalek's means of revival. And then... I have only one thing to say to you. Bye! It's Tennant's sudden change of expression that makes this such a highlight for me. Throughout the whole of his tenure as the Doctor, this is definitely my favourite aspect of his performance. His goddamn face. I honestly don't think an actor compares in expressiveness. Everybody's locked onto the TARDIS that's now materialising in some random street, but the location doesn't matter as that beautiful piano theme for Rose plays as soon as Donna suggests turning around to see whose footsteps are coming. The music is enough to bring one to tears of joy. The running, the smiling, the swelling of the score. The cruel, unflinching hatred of the Daleks manifests itself in this scene. It wouldn't have mattered if it was ordered to be here or was just wandering around looking for something to kill. Time literally slows down as fate once again stamps its foot down, attempting to keep Rose and the Doctor apart. What an incredible moment. For a first time viewer, the possibility of regeneration is on the table and even Sarah Jane and Torchwood could be killed off. The lack of plot immunity after everything that transpired in this episode creates possibly the greatest cliffhanger the show has ever ever produced. So, did it suck? Well, I don't think I had a single bad thing to say about this episode. Oh, apart from Martha's friend getting overly exterminated, but Christ, that's so tiny. This episode is just a roller coaster of emotions. One minute you're filled with dread, the next you're laughing or crying. There's not a dull moment to be found. The scale of it all is awe-inspiring. It feels so rewarding both as a long-time viewer and a first-time viewer to see all the pieces slowly folding together that leaves enough room for a bombardment of twists and turns to look forward to in the finale. I give The Stolen Earth a 10 out of 10.
Yeah, we'll worry. God, they really don't mess about with kicking off this episode, do they? I think this shot of the companions just says it all. They're speechless. I'm speechless. Meanwhile, Mickey and Jackie then appear rather conveniently to save Sarah Jane. It was curious that all the cliffhangers were saved by the dead. No, seriously, one of Torchwood's dead team members sorted out a time lock for Gwen and Deanto. Jackie and Mickey are reported amongst the dead from the Dalek Cybermen invasion. And the Doctor's rotting dead hand allowed him to regenerate without changing his physiology. So no, it's not a cop-out, it's brilliant. It all started getting very Star Wars though, as the TARDIS got tractor beamed up to the Crucible. The Daleks even have a trapdoor like Jabba the Hutt. This moment was timed well though, as only seconds beforehand, the Doctor was saying how great everything had been going collectively, and then the party gets separated and Donna's about to be burned to a crisp. Hindsight's a funny thing, but even 10 minutes in, you don't get a moment to breathe in this episode. The Doctor's furious, felt here, panting with clenched teeth, completely powerless. It's his power as a Time Lord that takes the helm of this scenario, as his human counterpart is born in the TARDIS. It's you! Oh yes. Kid. Oh yes! I can't help but think of that time when they tried using the same gag with Matt Smith and it came off as so... Ugh, come on Harry, stay focused on when the show was good. That same teeth clench is seen when the doppelganger gets himself and Donna out of the Crucible's core. You are bonkers! <laughs> Their conversation was so hilariously fascinating. The way Tennant is able to incorporate Donna's mannerisms into his own performance is another testament to him as a performer. It's subtle until catchphrases come out like Tourette's. Boy, watch it, Earth Girl. Ooh. I sound like you. Oh, that's disgusting. Oi! Oi! Stop it! The crux of it all is that Donna doesn't believe she's worthwhile. In the presence of Rose Tyler, Unit, Torchwood, Sarah Jane, she feels like the late comer to this bizarre world of the Doctor. At first I thought the heartbeat moments Donna experienced in the finale were just a demonstration of her anxiety of unworthiness, but apparently it's destiny. God damn destiny that brought them together. Or Dalek Khan, whichever floats your boat. It feels a bit cheap, but with all the weirdness and interstellar performances, I'm once again able to turn a blind eye to the convenience of it all. Martha gets zapped to Germany, where the German Daleks are screaming, <laughs> That was classic. This spooky gothic tower she arrives at though is creepy in itself, not to mention how slowly we are creeping towards finding out what this key does. Things are confused somewhat by this German speaking character who doesn't even have subtitles. You can read up what the translation is on that previously mentioned BBC fact file on the episode. It's truly fascinating. I think the reason they didn't bother giving this character subtitles though is because her body language language, facial expressions, and gestures do all the talking for her. Ultimately, it indicates that she cannot bring herself to kill Martha because she knows deep down she would rather die than be held captive by murderous aliens. Jack then escapes from the Dalek dustbin rather conveniently. He survived the furnace, sure, but am I to believe this tiny door just opened itself for him? Meanwhile, the Doctor and Rose are imprisoned with Davros and Khan. The Doctor figures out that Davros is isn't in charge fairly quickly. We have an arrangement. No, 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 <laughs> no, I've got the word. You're the Daleks. And already their conversation is just fantastic. They start discussing destiny, and Khan is the perfect candidate for this, as he was the one who flew into the Time War and survived. Even though he was just one of Dalek sex underlings, his importance grew from the moment he escaped the Doctor's clutches at the end of Evolution of the Daleks. The Daleks start testing the reality bomb, and... It's my least favourite part of this episode. SJ, Mickey and Jackie are being guided into a room with a crowd of people. Sarah Jane finds a little room to hide in, guarded by a door. Firstly, why would Daleks ever have need for a door? Secondly, nobody notices Sarah or Mickey move away from the crowd, or even when she calls right out to him. Mickey! Mickey! Jackie! 
whilst this extra is moaning away amidst the crowd. Ah! Oh. You will stand. I can't. You will stand. I can't. Why can't I? So it turns out that all the planets being aligned in this pattern allow the Daleks to exterminate on an unprecedented scale. Don't get me wrong, I loved the twists, but the execution leaves a lot to be desired. I was happy that Jackie got away with the zap teleporter from Doomsday, but this footage of all these extras evaporating has not aged well. I do like to think that the Daleks have failed so many times exterminating everybody one at a time that they've just given up on any forms of domination in favour of ridding the universe of everything but Daleks. And food, of course. And maybe water, and air, and sunlight. Of course, this only leaves the Daleks to destroy themselves at that point, but let's not pretend like the Daleks have ever had reason or logic programmed into them. Davros steals the scene back though with this big speech about dust becoming atoms and atoms becoming nothing. His words and Julian Bleacher's performance amplify the horror that was attempted by the demonstration, giving this character the spotlight he deserves. Elsewhere on the Crucible, Jack smashes his way out of another furnace and meets up with the three test survivors. I loved Mickey and Jack's reunion, but Sarah Jane then reveals she has her own Osterhagen key called a Warp Star. Not just that, but Martha reveals the key's own similar purpose of destruction. She and Rose meeting was a really tremendously short-lived moment, and before you know it, the other companions are ready to blow every Thing apart too. At first I groaned a little seeing another zoomy communication scenario here, but we have another short-lived encounter between Sarah and Davros which was also excellent. The hype train is frozen in time because the Doctor's inconsistencies are laid bare for all to see. When I was humming and harring about how he would react to this army of his, this revealing of the Doctor's soul just happens to be slap bang in the middle of this episode, and it is glorious. The man who Pause of violence, never carrying a gun. But this is the truth, Doctor. You take ordinary people and you fashion them into weapons. We're getting that same quaking boot moment like with Eccleston in the episode Dalek, where he doesn't seem so different from them after all. Murray Gold's score and Tennant's expressions created this mind-blowing and heartbreaking moment. It's enough to make you forget about the universe ending and the fact that Donna and the other Doctor are still sitting in the TARDIS waiting to come along and save the day. The Daleks then magically teleport all the companions into the vault room with Davros to bear witness to the end of the universe. Even Donna and the other Doctor show up with little success. That is, until the reality bomb is stopped by pressing a button. You mean to tell me that they provided Davros with the off switch down in the vault? Why was such a button even created? I'll grant them that all the wibbly wobbly timey wimey dialogue that Donna spews to explain what's happening was the only way they could stop this scene looking totally incredulous. Not only does this method get the Time Lord out of sticky situations all the time, but now that Donna has a part of him inside her, that's what she said, I'm willing to be gentler with my criticism. Besides, it's a laugh seeing the Daleks all spinning around out of control. It's like the vault of doom and gloom has suddenly turned into a party with people mingling and having fun. Fun. They don't even need giant laser guns to deal with the Daleks. They can just push them around. It is certainly a lot of fun, and this rather miraculous means of escape does come with a heavy price. Even Dalek Khan turned around at the last minute, claiming to have had a hand in the downfall of this new Dalek Empire. In spectacular fashion, Jack destroyed the Red Dalek, and conveniently, another button just destroys all the Daleks. Again, though, repercussions for this are coming and this was forewarned not by Dalek Khan but by Davros. He lays the blame entirely at the Doctor's feet. I name you forever! You are the destroyer of the worlds! And I think this moment harkens back to J. Robert Oppenheimer's famous words. I don't think it's too far a stretch either to suggest that Osterhagen is an alteration of Oppenheimer, seeing as the key would have activated a bunch of nuclear weapons. Or maybe it's just an anagram of Earth's 
gone. Inside the TARDIS, all our heroes are trying to sling the Earth back to where it came from. The Doctor has a quick conversation with Gwen back at Torchwood Base, where they establish her as being a descendant of the Maid in the Unquiet Dead episode. Just so you guys know, we passed 200 patrons a few days ago, which is amazing, so work has begun on a review of that particular episode, alongside some mini Torchwood and Sarah Jane Adventures reviews coming soon too. This scene in the TARDIS really does make you appreciate watching all those spin-offs because they actually save the day. It was great that K9 had a little cameo here and fitted perfectly into the narrative too. As if there weren't more things to be revealed, it's here that the Doctor establishes the TARDIS is meant to be operated by not one, but six pilots. This is a perfect explanation for why he's always jumping around so fast frantically trying to fly the thing that I didn't even know I wanted. One last burst of teamwork, everyone flying the TARDIS together. Except Jackie though, that was pretty hilarious. <laughs> When the party's over, it's time for a farewell for each of the passengers in some random park. I think Sarah Jane's departure was super sad though. Her comment about the Doctor having the biggest family on Earth was beautiful, and it pulled on the heartstrings knowing that she'll never get to tell that long story of hers. Rest in peace, Elizabeth Sladen. Mickey's return to the Doctor's universe was noble of him too, rounding off his plotline well for the time being. The rest of the party got dragged to the parallel universe, where Jackie had the new Doctor on by saying she called her son Doctor, which was also side-splitting. For the audience, however, this is the saddest place in the Hooniverse. Now, however, Rose has the Doctor in the best capacity possible. There might well be a parallel Doctor in this universe, but instead of wasting Rose's limited lifespan searching for him, she can just settle with a compromise. She's not happy about this arrangement at first, and immediately you can tell from Tennant's expression that he's got the biggest frog in his throat right now. Incredibly, we don't get the satisfaction of either Doctor audibly saying the words, I love you. This is tragic for the Doctor though, as he once again leaves the woman he loves on that same beach, this time, in the hands of another man. What a sacrifice to make. I mean, at least he knows she's gonna be happy, but like last time, there isn't even a goodbye, but the Doctor consciously leaves this time because there's still one anomaly left to solve. Donna. Good God. This segment is sad. Right from the start, the Doctor can't even look at Donna for more than a second or two before she starts malfunctioning. You know you can fix that chameleon circuit if you just tried hot binding the fragment links and superseding the binary, 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 I'm fine. You can almost hear Donna crying out from within here. The denial she expresses is that same denial of her own importance, and that saddening music that plays not only makes this moment hit home hard, but it reminds me that the golden era of the show is ending. The show has not reached a high point like this since, and probably never will. That's the saddest part, watching this with hindsight. The Doctor drops Donna home and bears the brunt of it all by explaining to Wilf, Sylvia, and the audience the price for saving the universe. The Doctor gives Sylvia the best possible backhanded response before Donna comes in, awake and basically reverted to factory settings. Gossip Gossiping, moaning, texting, just as she was in The Runaway Bride. Sylvia gets the last word in though, telling the Doctor to leave with this jarring close-up, and then the rain begins. With so many The Doctor is Lonely Once Again moments in the show, this one takes the cake for me. The rain itself does such a great job at representing the emotion the Doctor holds inside. He doesn't have to cry buckets. The rain shows this idea for us, accompanies by the music and Wilf promising to look out for him with his telescope in the night sky, it's so bloody beautiful. The salute, the ascent in the score, and for the first time, there's no... What? What? 
What? Just straight up depression. He saved the universe, but once again is destined for solitude. Even leaving the finales ending in this unconventional fashion is like a cliffhanger in itself. The score ends on an imperfect cadence, and of course that one little unresolved aspect of the story lingers heavy over the Doctor's head. Donna can never know about him or what she did, otherwise she'll burn up. That, however, is a tale for another time. So, did it suck? Nah. It's strange because for the longest time my judgement on this episode was clouded by that one moment when Donna suddenly became hyper intelligent. It honestly ruined the episode for me for the longest time, but Rewatching it again, I've definitely changed my mind about it. It's the final act with the goodbyes that really kill me. Davros and the megalomaniac performance is something to behold, and can I also just say, I miss Murray Gold so much. The themes heard playing in this episode span from all four series. Every character is triumphantly celebrated with leitmotifs and the rest of the score carries the episode beautifully. The characters, the writing, Davies and his team really outdone themselves in these final episodes of series four. I give Journey's End a nine out of 10. <sighs> Thanks for watching. I hope this was worth your while. Please consider supporting these videos by making a pledge on my Patreon page today. Plenty of exclusive content is coming. What do you think of these episodes? Comment below or join us for a Benny on my Discord server, where we'll continue this discussion.